Welcome back, guys, to part two of Daniel Con Vetterlein's talk. Now, this episode, we're going to go a lot more in depth in regards to the Plecos, and this is where he's going to really shine. If this guy can't make you absolutely fall in love with these uh, these fishes, I honestly don't think anybody can. So hopefully, you enjoy. Don't forget to subscribe. Now, Daniel, you you, you talk about these uh, Papilia. Yeah. How does it say? Papilia? Papilia. And, uh, like, I think... I. I think really, after watching your presentation, like I, I told you, I was just blown away by the presentation. There were so many things, and we, I was so engaged that we had so many questions. I think your half hour, 45 five minute presentation went on for about two hours in my basement here the other day. Uh, much shorter at the presentation at the DFO, but uh, we had so much fun talking about stuff. I think we need to go a little bit more in detail. I think we have to find a way to make people really appreciate what these are. Like, like I, I understand how you're fascinated by it, and you made me fascinated by it. Let's make them fascinated by it. And these, these little papillae, like the, thing, the, the closest thing I can think to that it's not related to it at all, but I'm just wondering if it's something that maybe people could relate to is they often think about uh, a, a chameleon. Take a chameleon, yeah. for example. And the chameleon has two eyes that work completely independently and stuff like that. Yeah. And everyone's just blown away because we can't do that. As people, we can't do that. Uh, the, the, these papillae on these plecos, each one of them is doing stuff on its kind of on its own. It's yeah, all controlled, yeah, yeah. and not only them. On top of the papillae, there's those other structures, and those are all different depending on the need or the purpose. And what are those called? Unculi. Unculi. Yeah. Very cool words. These are going to come up in trivia later, but uh, each a lot, a lot of those structures can do things independently. That we talked a little bit about the fins and stuff like that. Like, do you want to maybe go a bit more into the uh, the, yeah. the 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 uncle and the into the computer? Yeah. So actually, the thing is, so so you mentioned uh, chameleons. They have one eye, two eye, and this is hilarious, of course, and that's perfect. But in plecos, it's actually way more interesting, at least for me, because as I said, they have the, the upper lip, they have the old, uh, the the lower lip. And then on some species, on each lower lip, they have have up to three hundred fifty of these papillae. So let's just say elongations. So they have, this is one of the papillae, and on these papillae they have several unculi, as we call them, which can be like uh, small feather fin structures, like mushroom struct structures. And every uh, every papilla itself is like um, one connection to the surface that the fish is sucking on. So when you're saying chameleons are great, yes they are, but they can they they only have two different structures working independently from each other. In those plecos, it is they have the lower lip, and each of the three hundred uh, papilla is working on its own. So they can remove fifty from the surface, and they still have two hundred fifty attaching to the surface. And this is also how they can like uh, walk over a, a glass surface, for example. They just say, okay, let's remove the half of them. Let's say one hundred fifty, and the other hundred fifty are still attached to the glass. And that way, they can move on the glass and still. Uh, go on feeding. Well, you showed me a, a video. Maybe we can put a little clip of that video in this video yeah. uh, of uh, I believe it was a chase to stoma. Yeah. yeah. And, and and how it how it moved in like incredibly surging water, and it just it was almost like it, it was inching forward, but it was using all the muscles of its face to do it. Uh, one it may, it may be a silly question, but why just the lower lip? Why did you study just the lower? Is there was there a reason that you yeah. said let's start there? So there were actually two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the video you mentioned is um, you can see you can clearly see that the fish is um, attaching to the to the stone with the lower lip, and he's moving the uh, the upper lip just like this to scrape on the on the stone to scrape okay. off food like algae for example microorganisms. So the dentition bio, bio the dentition is more advanced uh, uh, towards the forward part for most part for Den the way that they're scraping. Den dentition scraper. as well, yeah. So they have more teeth in the uh, in the, the lower jaw. And bigger, kind, slightly bigger teeth in the in the upper jaw, and use those teeth to scrape on the algae, on the microorganisms, on the, all this biofilm stuff to scrape our food. While they are attaching to the surface, they're actually feeding on with the lower lip mainly. So this was one reason, and the other reason was simply that um, there we have more papilla on the lower lip. So the diversity in papillar is way bigger on the lower lip than it is on the upper lip. Yeah, you showed us many different pictures of uh, like the different different genera of plecos and how it was so varied in, in the papilla and how the structures on their on their oral disc were different. Uh, maybe maybe next thing, because we already kind of alluded to it a little bit, is 
a lot of people just think plecos are plecos. I, I kind of jokingly yeah, said, yeah. mine eat poop and stuff like that. But you showed us some videos and some pictures yesterday, like the, the, the variants of the different dentition in this. This is like my interest is mostly in cichlids and stuff. But uh, you showed me that and like all the different types of dentition that these plecos had. Obviously, it's very similar to the way the plecos are, or, or to, sorry, my interest in the cichlids is that they're very varied and they, they've been able to adapt to all the different types of vegetation, all the different types of food sources that are available to them. So maybe, maybe a little, can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about the dentition, so, what, that maybe plecos aren't all the same? Then, oh, definitely not. But dentition is actually the, the thing that made me look more into the papilla because while I was taking pictures of the, of the old discs, I was taking pictures of the teeth at all, mainly, and then they're huge, huge differences. So for example, we have, say, uh, we have the Barrientes of Chantelos, it's known as Golden Nugget or L18, L177 for example. Mm -hmm. A very, very popular fish. It's not that expensive, it's very, uh, very easy to get, so every shop uh, runs it actually. And um, they feed on algae, on microorganisms, on like very, very small stuff. We call them herbivores. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an off-hook feeder. An off it's, feeder, it's, exactly. it basically yeah. it's the bio cover. Yeah. Exactly, so they have tons of small teas. It's the, the, the teas are so small that you can uh, hardly count them on a picture. So they're very, very fine teas, very long teas, very, very fine ones. And, and they constantly are rasping the surface of the Exactly, the, the, so they the, just yeah. look for, for a big stone, for a flat stone, if possible. They just scrape over the stone like all day long. And this is how they get their, their food because, of course, they're mainly herbivores. They have to feed uh, all day long. <laughs> so to get all the, all the proteins, all the... Uh, or the calories they, they really you need. You see videos or pictures and you see almost like these these jagged little trails on these rock yeah, yeah, surfaces exactly, and stuff yeah. like that. That's you probably can, for that's perfect example. You can tell exactly example. where they have been before. Yeah. Then we have another fish which is um, from the same habitat as L18, L177, um, the one we are just talking about, which is um, Solacanticus pirarara, the, I think it's called uh, Red Scarlet Pleco, or L25 of course. Yeah, yeah I know 25. And, yeah. Um, they're living more or less in the same spot in the Xingu in Brazil, but they feed on something totally else. So they're inhabiting the same biotope, but L25 mainly feeds on, on mussels, on snakes. So they have general, long, almost like rabbit-like teeth. Exactly, so they have very long, very strong teeth. They're like this in shape, it's almost like an S shape. And uh, they have very, very few teeth because they're going for meat stuff, yeah. actually. So, so those are carnivorous fish. And this is a very nice example that two fish living more or less on the same stone in the same river you know what they'd probably like? They'd probably like birds. They would, uh, I guess they would. Yeah. Fried, possibly. Yeah. Fried barbecue? Food. Yeah, they like barbecue yeah, chicken. Everybody, everybody likes barbecue, of course, yeah. <laughs> Especially the Brazilian fish. <laughs> but this is a very nice example of how two fish living at the same spot in the, in the same river, sharing the same parameters, are totally different from each other. Yeah. Only because of their dentition, because of different um, feeding, feeding habits. And this goes through all the different genera. So we have the Chytostoma you already mentioned, they're living in mountain creeks, and they live in very, very fast flowing water, which is like, uh, the, the rivers are like constant rapids. So they're really- they're extremely laterally compressed, you know, they're almost exactly. they're flat fish. Very flat yeah. fish, attaching very, very well to the, to, the, uh, to the stone or to the any given structure surface. And they're also feeding on algae. They have even more teeth than Bayern Sisos has. Then we have, of course, something very interesting as well, in a different subfamily even of the family of Loricaridae. We have the Loricariina, the so-called whiptail catfishes. Mm -hmm. And we have some genera like sort of Myodon or Cross Loricaria. They don't live on the surface, they dig into the sand. So, and they, for example, they have huge teeth as well. They're mainly carnivorous um, species. And they have a lot very um, distinct barbels over here. So they don't have a, a round oral disc, no sucky mouse disc as all the other plecos do. They have more or less like an oval disc, which is not really. They had a very disc few of those structures. It was more barbels and stuff for exactly. sensory. A, a lot of barbels going to all directions, and whenever they are looking for food, they lift their head a little bit, and then they're kind of trying to uh, look out for food with those barbels with yeah. sensory organs. Yeah, and so we, it's very very diverse. So we have a lot of different um, options. Let's say no, no, not options, but we have a lot of different methods. To look out for food, actually. Yeah. So we have the dentition, we have the uh, the the barbels in in some species. It's very very diverse, and nobody's really looking after this. Everybody knows uh, the chameleon we already mentioned. Everybody knows 
the gecko we talked about, yeah. even people that don't keep geckos at all or don't keep fish. But there's so many people that keep blackos and so many people and that know nothing about the other one. Look at the yeah. exactly. So even people that keep cichlids, for example, they mainly ignore the beautiful blackos. Nobody cares about them, and they see them every day on the glass, and nobody thinks about okay, how do I do this? Yeah. So this is. For me, then the main part why I got into it. That's very cool. It's just a lot of. Now, one other thing I was thinking about. This is more. This is more relation to me. I was asked to develop a talk uh, about uh, cichlids and evolution, and yeah. it was it was a kind of a personal talk for me. And um, as, I, as I've told you, yeah, I've kind of gone through a lot of evolution in my fish room since I've moved five years ago and changing and trying to figure out where where my niche is again and what I need to get back to doing and stuff. And when I was asked to do this talk, I started going back and using all my all, all my uh, my knowledge from all the years and all my readings and stuff. And I, I, I knew what a cichlid was. I knew everything about cichlids, and like I I was very comfortable in that that area. Not not the same with catfish, the same way as you are. But the thing that really struck me is when I started building this talk, I started going online and actually looking for different words and different things like that. They were just kind of sparked my memory of things maybe I'm missing out and stuff. And uh, my whole life, my whole aquatic life literally came crashing down on me because everything that I knew uh, about the study of semantics, the study of um, uh, all the different measurements of meristics and morphometrics and everything that we used before that were tangible, that things that we could measure and see, they weren't at the strong focus anymore. And cichlids no longer were related to the fish that we've always known them to be and everything was changed. Now, with a, and that all changed when it was, it was, it was, it was not, wasn't just recently, it wasn't the past few years, it's the fact that I've been out of it, it was several years ago, uh, but uh, with the introduction of uh, molecular genoming and, and the study of DNA, and I'm sure that's had some massive ramifications in the catfish world, too. Yeah, same happened in catfish, yeah. so. Be there, has there been anything that's been, like, completely gutting and shocking for you? Well, there was uh, one paper, it was published in 2015, was a huge phylogeny of the whole family of Luricarida. And until this point, we were, just as you said, in, similar to cichlids, everybody looked at morphology, anatomy, so we were go mm -hmm. mainly going by bone structures, by the general phenotype, and some species that we know very, very well in the hobby, so species we breed very frequently, were suddenly put into a, a different genus, yeah. which for us, for us like hobbyists, is totally wrong because they look different, they behave different, but still the DNA told us this would be the right thing. Yeah. And we, there's still some... some well, we used an example where when we were talking earlier, uh, upstairs off camera, we were talking about o over, over a couple of drinks, and we had two cans of beer, and they looked exactly the same on the outside. Yeah. And as most hobbyists, we, we view those fish as a hobbyist. We look at it, well, it looks kind of like this, so it's got to be related to this. The color pattern might be different. It might come from further south or west or east. It might from a different river drainage system. And that's how we kind of put all the fish into their different groupings, you know, fin shapes and whatnot. But the real thing, when it came down to actual measurements, there was a lot of things that were kind of under the surface that most average hobbyists don't know about. You know, like we talked about scales and fin rays and things like that, but like structures like the otolith, like the inside of the bone yeah. and stuff like that, of the ear bone and stuff. Those are things that a hobbyist can't find unless they kill their fish and actually dissect it. But That's those we were do. things that were very, very important for, for, uh, for using for, for diagnostic traits for measuring fish. And, and catfish, they obviously do the same thing. It's, it, it, they use the same tools to measure. It doesn't matter what, matter what family of fish. Yeah, they use them the all same. to put them in the same order. Most of my background, not just in fish. Fish, I'm more of a hobbyist, but most of my background was in the botany, and it was the same thing. You were actually deconstructing the plant to be able to figure out where it fit and how the veins worked and everything, and to try to figure out how they worked. So, This is what I do with my catfish like all day long. When I, when I have the free time, dissecting all you can get. Remember, we talked about the yeah. girl thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going about yeah. it wrong. Yeah, you, you yeah. promised me this is not going to be online, so I, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> no, you're totally safe. <laughs> you're totally safe. Nobody's seeing this except for See, you and me. I'm trusting you. <laughs> cool.